This is Lecture 8, Southeast Asia. When we look at Southeast Asia, um, we look at two major parts here. Uh, the southeastern part of the mainland, which is sometimes known as Indochina, or used to be known as Indochina, and then the islands, which include Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Uh, the region is very water-based. There's a lot of water in this region, and part of it is because there's a lot of precipitation in, in the area. The main river is the Mekong, which runs through about six of the countries of southeastern Asia. So it's very wet. There's a lot of rain, a lot of humidity. Uh, it's very tropical. There's a large tropical rainforest on the island of Borneo. Uh, they do suffer from earthquakes in some places, particularly when you look at Indonesia, uh, also at the Philippines. Tsunamis are typical, which are tidal waves. Rice is a big, important crop in this region, and every country grows rice here. And the predominant religion of the area is Buddhism. Excuse me. Looking back, we have a lot of early kingdoms. We're talking back before the time of Christ. Uh, the Chinese came in somewhere between 800 and 900 A.D., maybe earlier than that. And up until the 14, 1500s, the Chinese were the predominant group of people in this region. Uh, then the Europeans start coming, the Portuguese first, and then later the, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Dutch uh, all entered into this region. Later on, the French and the British. And so that was in the 1500s and the 1600s. By the early 1900s, the Japanese start becoming... Uh, more powerful and imperialistic and expanding in their uh, dominion. Eventually, these countries after World War II are granted their independence, and since then, they've kind of had some growing pains trying to establish who's going to run this country, uh, who determines that this is independent, things like that. And this is a, a Buddhist temple, very weird looking, I know. It's kind of interesting, though, a very cool architecture. Uh, Vietnam, <clears throat> the first country here used to be North Vietnam and South Vietnam after independence because that's the way that the United Nations and um, United States and France and everybody else decided it would be set up. So we have a North Vietnam, which is communist, and a South Vietnam, which is democratic. But the Vietnamese people, especially the North Vietnamese, wanted one Vietnam because they're all the same people. They speak the same language. They're of the same culture for the most part. Um, so they wanted one country, and so North Vietnam, which was communist, invaded South Vietnam. And the French tried to fight off the communists for a while, and they got the Americans involved. And so by 1965, the United States was fighting a war that it didn't even want to get into in Vietnam, which lasted from 1965 to about 1975 that the Americans were in Vietnam trying to prevent all of Vietnam from becoming communist. Sadly, it did not work, and we left. <clears throat> one of the big things the Vietnamese farmers grow is shrimp. And they grow shrimp there like we grow catfish here in ponds, but their ponds are kind of roped in enclosures, kind of like cages, in the Mekong Delta, in the bodies of water off the coast of Vietnam. And today tourism is really big in Vietnam. A lot of the old veterans that fought in the Vietnam War go back today to Vietnam, ride their motorcycles around, go see old sites, because it's peaceful there today. It is communist, but it's very peaceful. <clears throat> we also have Cambodia. Cambodia is home to this huge ancient ruin of Angkor Wat. Um, after Vietnam fell or, to the communists, Cambodia started going through a um, revolution of its own, which was partially inspired by Vietnam and the American invasion into Cambodia. Uh, this group called the Khmer Rouge was the group that started this uprising led by a guy named Pol Pot. Pol Pot was a guy who did not like to have any opponents whatsoever. So what he did is he encouraged everyone to move to the country. And if they did not move to the country, he would execute you. So um, he was very much into... Um, Maoist beliefs of communism. Everyone moved to the country, everybody farmed, because we need to make sure everybody survives. And if you're an intelligent person, you're smarter than Pol Pot, I'm going to kill you because you are an opponent of mine. And so he would 
move these people out into fields. He would capture them, move them into fields, and kill them all. Called the Killing Fields, and uh, that was a very tragic time from the 70s into the 80s in Cambodia. Uh, but since like 1984, 1985, Pol Pot was captured. Um, tourism has now become a big deal. Cambodia is now peaceful again. It's a nice place to go. It's very warm and tropical, just like Vietnam. But uh, now it's very touristy. Now, the Golden Triangle. This is one thing that I made sure you learned about reading in your book. Of the four or five major drug-producing areas in the world, one of them is this region, the Golden Triangle. The other one, the Golden Crescent, I mentioned, and it's where a lot of the heroin, poppies, opium come from in Afghanistan. On the Golden Triangle, this is where they also grow a lot of poppies. Uh, part of northern Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, they grow a lot of poppies, which they turn into heroin. Other drugs also come from this region, too. But it's kind of a lawless, the government really doesn't control this part of the country very well, these countries very well, and it's kind of run by drug trades. Uh, Laos is a very rural country. Its most famous person is the neighbor from King of the Hill, if you've ever watched King of the Hill. Uh, Myanmar, what's formerly known as Burma, but uh, the military took over the country and kicked the president out of office and uh, said, no, we're no longer Burma, we're now called Myanmar, and they're known for their rubies. Now, the former president, should be president of Myanmar, Burma, is Aung San Suu Kyi, and she's the daughter of the first prime minister of Burma, the first leader of Burma after it gained its independence, was her dad. And so she was elected prime minister, but the military said, no, it's not fair. She shouldn't be it. We're going to take the country over. And so the government took over the country, the military, sorry, took over the government in 1989 and placed her under arrest. And there have been attempts uh, to free her. And eventually she was freed last year and ran for office and is now a member of parliament. So she's back in like the Senate of Burma. She won the Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years back. She's a very intelligent person. One of her sons is from the, or lives in the United States. Um, but uh, she should be the leader of Burma. And there's a lot of debate about how do we put her back in office. But she's slowly gaining ground and moving back toward being prime minister again. So the junta, J-U-N-T-A, of Myanmar or Burma are these leaders, these military leaders who take control of the country, and they actually took control back in 1988. They moved the capital, and they just said, all right, if you're a government worker tomorrow, pack up your stuff, you're moving. We're moving to this new city that we just built for you. In 2008, a large cyclone, hurricane, hit Burma, and the U.S. was like, oh, here's you know a couple of billion dollars we want to give you, or however much it was. And Burma's like, no, we don't need it. We can take care of our own people, which is a lie because they, they can't. And they even have their own standards of measure, like, you know, we have inches or feet here in the United States. When you go to, like, Canada, it's in, like, meters and centimeters. They have a different, complete unit of measure in Burma. It's weird. Um, and this is at the border of Burma. It says the Tamadol and the people cooperate and crush all those harming the Union. Basically, we will not take kindly to those who oppose our government. So it's, it's kind of getting the point across, across the point that we don't need your help. Uh, Thailand was formerly known as Siam. It's one of the few countries that was never under European colonization. You can go back through Thailand's history and you can see where it never was it ruled by a French, British, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, Russian, any type of Euro European colonization. Uh, Thailand is known for its spicy food. Food's del food is delicious, but spicy. The capital city of Thailand is Bangkok. They are known for their tourism, but um, also a lot of sex slaves, and this happens in Thailand a lot. You might have a 12 or 13-year-old boy or girl that's taken in, that's kidnapped, uh, placed in a brothel in a room, tied to a bed, and then they tell the kid, we know where you live, we abducted you from your house. If you decide to escape, we'll go back to your home and kill your parents. So you're now forced to be a sex slave. And this happens a lot in Thailand. And there are people trying to get this fixed. But there are a lot of businessmen that come from China, Japan, the United States that go to Thailand to go have sex with these kids. And it's, it's a travesty. Um, 
Interesting here, this sign says, uh, and this is a warning sign for Bangkok because they really want to be clean. You know, one is not allowed to spit saliva or phlegm, discard cigarette stubs, or pour, drop dirt or rubbish in a public area, outside litter bins, or in the street, or on the floor of a public place. An offender subject to a 2,000 baht fine maximum, which is not a lot of money, but they really want to get a point across that they want to keep Bangkok clean. Malaysia uh, is got two parts to it. It's known for its rubber production. This is um, the Petronas Towers, which are in Kuala Lumpur, the capital city of Malaysia. It is Islamic, and they do a lot of technology development there. 